Me? Hi. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Beth. Um, it's wonderful to be here tonight. Is that okay? Okay, great. Um, and it's also wonderful to be here at OSU this quarter. Um, I'm honored to be this year's Baumer Visiting Professor, and um, so I want to thank all the people who were involved in bringing me here, Mike Cadwell, Beth Blostein, and also Karen Lewis, who first introduced me to the school last year. Um, I've really enjoyed the experiences that I've had here so far. Um, I enjoy being in this wonderful building um, with great colleagues and also very engaged and demanding students. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, an old and a couple of new projects by Interborough, um, the architecture and planning practice that I founded with my partners, Tobias Ambors and Daniel Dioka in 2002. Um, and when we started our company, um, we called it Interborough, mostly because it was a very ubiquitous, very everyday name in New York City. Um, and if you look up Interborough in the phone book, um, you'll see pages and pages of listings. It's a name that attaches itself um, to everything from funeral homes uh, to petroleum tankers. But there, yeah? Oh, sorry. We're gonna turn you down. Am I talking too loud? Oh, you have two mics on me. I think that might be, is that the problem? Yeah. Okay, is that better? Okay. Um, so as I was saying, there was no interborough architecture, um, so we thought we would step in. Um, and like the name interborough, our firm really does a, a very, very wide range of things. Um, and I'm going to give you a quick overview tonight. Um, we work on a variety of project types uh, with a variety of clients and a range of deliverables. Um, but despite this variety, there are certain constants. Um, something that we're very interested in um, is how people use and transform places every day. Um, how meaning um, and sometimes the form of a place or a building is changed over time by the people or forces that are typically beyond the control of the architect. Um, and sometimes we work in an almost journalistic way to document and visualize such everyday transformations. And sometimes we use um, what we find just kind of as raw material for our design work. Um, and in our design work, we strive to create places that are as ambiguous, um, that are ambiguous enough to be appropriated and transformed in many different ways. Um, and we, we strive uh, to create what Barry Bergdahl um, has called public rec rooms. And I think he means that in a positive way. Um, places that are informal enough uh, for people to casually use and make their own. Um, in our more journalistic work, um, in our role as architects, we, our role is really to sort of, um, I would say, document and visualize. Uh, currently, for example, we're working on a project about the elderly in New York City. Um, it turns out that a disproportionate number um, of the elderly um, in New York live in so-called towers in the park, um, in limited equity housing cooperatives that were built by unions in the 1950s. And the tower in the park, of course, is really a much maligned modernist housing typology that is often been considered to be a failure, um, especially these days. But it turns out that um, they work remarkably well as housing for the elderly. And in fact, the residents of many of these towers have declared themselves NORCs, naturally occurring retirement communities. And they seek to retroactively turn these um, buildings into retirement homes. Um, so we're investigating how these towers have um, found a second calling, so to speak, um, as a place for people to age in place. Um, and we're developing a guide to NORCs and NYC, which um, also sort of um, summarizes the steps um, it takes to form a NORC and visualizing, um, visualizing the process. And in this way, it really is a form of um, advocacy. And this is something that I want to return to um, uh, later in, in my talk. Um, so I said before, um, there's a picture of that. I said before that sometimes studying what's already there produces raw material for production. Um, and um, it's, I would say it's sort of a, a source of um, inspiration for us. Um, in a way, um, it's in order to tap into a kind of local knowledge that only um, those people who um, are already using a place have. Um, so for example, the very first project we did many years ago was a project for a dead shopping mall. 
Um, the mall had been built in the 70s, but it was never really successful for a lot of different reasons, and it closed its doors in the 90s. And when we started to work here um, in 2002, um, almost all the businesses had left the place, and we had spent, uh, we spent really a lot of time looking um, for clues in this partially abandoned place that, as it turned out, was actually really full of life. Um, and there were all sorts of um, strange things going on here. Um, and you can see some of the clues that we collected on this, on this illustration. Yeah? I think this is the moment of strange things. There's a little circle in the center of your presentation that's been on since the beginning. And that's the UFO sign. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so what should I do? Move this way? Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry to be so, that it was also distracting for everyone. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so, okay, here are some of the clues. You can linger on those clues for a few moments. Um, and so, anyway, here's some of the clues. Someone driving around, um, there's a van driving around, there are these porta potties, RVs, um, uh, mobile homes, other signs of life. And then there was this guy sort of riding around in his um, golf cart, um, hopping out, picking up garbage, and then driving off. And then there was this, um, uh, there were these other things like this um, RV that had be become a hot dog truck. And um, uh, this was actually owned by this um, hot dog vendor. His name was Jay. And he'd noticed that um, after that the mall was abandoned, truckers started pulling into the parking lot, which was totally empty, and using it as an informal rest stop. Um, and he saw this as an opportunity to sell them food. Um, so he started this kind of um, informal, I would say a small business, an informal rest stop. Or this guy, Peter, um, he had one of the sort of the last remaining businesses in the, in the mall. Um, it was a combination of a, of a cleaners and also a, um, uh, a bus stop to, uh, for a bus that shuttled back and forth to Atlantic City. Um, and and, and um, the bus stop placed, the, the bus company placed it there because of all the available parking, and since Peter was all th there the whole day, um, they asked him if he would sell tickets, and it's really sort of wonderfully symbiotic, um, and it, it, in a funny way, it shows how a new business, um, even a new, new sort of public space, might emerge not from the conditions of density, like as in Rem Koolhaas's culture of congestion, but from the absence of density, where the remaining things have to merge in order to survive. So people like Jay and Peter obviously had studied the place very closely because they were able to carve out a living there. Um, and so in our design proposal, we adopted theirs and many, many, many other tactics to recolonize them all, and I'm not going to talk about them uh, now. But um, in doing this, there are two things, in doing this kind of work, there are two things that are very, very important to us. Um, one is to do thorough detective work. Um, listening, hanging around, looking for clues, and suspending judgment as long as possible um, in order to acquire located spatial knowledge. And, um, and, but also to sort of study all the available data um, and to do lots of interviews with real estate developers and street vendors alike. And this is something that um, I've had a lot of discussions with, with my students this semester. But two, um, we always try to look at a place through as many different eyes. Um, if architects and planners um, sometimes strive for a totalizing, comprehensive view, um, we strive to embrace the seeming infinity of conflicting partial views. Um, we've in abandoned the panoptic uh, for the oligoptic, which is a, um, is a word from Bruno Latour, windows that allow us to, quote, see a few things well. And so why, why all of this? Um, because we... We believe in an expanded role for architecture, this is something that Beth mentioned at the beginning, that goes beyond vi uh, visionary rhetoric or self-sufficient form making. Um, an architecture that pays close attention to what happens out there in order to engage it in a meaningful way. So I'd like to show you a couple of projects in more detail, um, beginning with an older one, um, uh, which is called Improve Your Lot. It's a project on Detroit, and it began as part of the Shrinking Cities, um, Shrink Shrinking Cities project. As probably all you know, Detroit has lost about a million people um, in the last 50 years. Um, and uh, because of that, Detroit has um, an unfathomable amount of vacant land. Um, but when we started this project, we said, let's not let this sort of like familiar narrative of like abandonment um, get the best of us. And we tried to really resist the kinds of um, uh, 
uh, these kinds of temptations to sort of romance the city's ruins, which um, have been done many times by people like um, Camila Vergara, who sort of suggested to actually you know, turn the city into a museum of ruins, or James Corner, um, who proposed that large swaths of the city should be, quote, returned to nature. Um, and recently, this, um, the, the, the city's mayor has actually embraced this as an idea. But aside from these being a bit too spectacular for our tastes, um, these visionaries tend to overlook the following facts about vacant land in Detroit today. One is that um, most of the vacant land consists of small, single-family lots next, next to occupied, occupied homes. And recently, many of these lots have been bought up, not by developers or speculators, but by the owners of the adjacent houses. Um, and we, we came up with a name for this. We call it blotting. Um, and we call the actual lot a blot. And um, as you can see here, it's when a homeowner takes, borrows, or buys one or more adjacent lots. Um, and uh, our, this, this project, Improve Your Lot, is our attempt to document this phenomenon, to think through and envision some of its implications, and then finally invent mechanisms to help it along a little. Why, you may ask? Well, for one, it's happening all over the city. Um, and until we started doing this project, no one had really noticed it. Um, and, and what we do notice is that it's essentially an epilogue to the, the familiar narrative of abandonment. It says that beyond the sort of this typical story of Detroit's decline and the low property values and the lack of access to credit, you can identify ways in which individual residents sort of really working in a very, very self-interested way, they actually try to take advantage of, of this shrinking city to increase their space and thereby improving their lot. And so it's Detroit, this is a picture of Detroit from the 1940s. It's basically um, a sort of a low-rise city. Um, it's, almost, it's almost entirely single family. And it's based on a grid of 30 by 100 foot parcels. Um, and this was the density of a typical block in the 50s. And so now with depopulation and disinvestment, many of these parcels were vacated, and which it created opportunities for adjacent homeowners to take the vacant land next to their homes um, and expand their parcels in kind of odd ways. Um, and so if you think about the kind of larger implications of this, you know, you have thousands of self-interested homeowners changing the genetic code of the city. They're making it less homogeneous, and they're effectively making it more suburban. Um, we actually um, use a, um, a we created a phrase, the new suburbanism. It talks about the cumulative effect of this, um, of like thousands of instances of blot making. I want to show you just a few examples of them quickly. Um, this is a garage blot trampoline blot, satellite dish blot, above ground pool blot, semicircular driveway blot. Um, there are carports, there are more permanent additions. Um, and some of them are really functional, like this handicap ramp uh, blot. Oh, by the way, there are actually a lot of blots in Columbus, too, and we've seen some of them like this. Um, uh, some blots are purely aesthetic, like this symmetrical one. Um, and there are some pretty magical ones, like this one with the, the sort of the, uh, the fe this sort of silver fence. So if you can find blots by driving around the city, you can also find them on your computer screen. And um, uh, we sort of came up with this technique we called kadoogling, where you compare the Google Earth view along with the sort of the, um, the, city, the tax assessor's database. So we like look for signs of a blot, like you know, for example, like parked car or vacant, you know, so some area rubbed away, grass rubbed away by use. So we thought, is this a blot? This is on the Google Earth. We go to the cadastral map. Here, we go to that same lot. We see that it's um, owned by Camille Spicer. We look at the next one, also owned by Camille Spicer. Yep, it's a blot. Um, and so we actually looked all over the city. And, so, um, and we found them almost in every single block. So here are some examples of them. This family actually owns a whole block. Um, and so on. And so um, for this project, we told a lot of stories about how these blots happened. Um, and I just want to point out a few. Um, this is the one of the, um, the Andron family. They basically um, created one by um, uh, connecting six, six parcels and putting a fence around it. Um, it starts like this, 1932. The, um, the, the mother, Jean Andron, she bought this house. Every single lot has a house. Uh, by 1992, completely surrounded by vacant city-owned lots. She bought the next one. Then her son bought two more, built a fence. Then they got two more. 
Um, and then they had this like amazing six lot lot. And here you can see it with this fence wrapping around it. The owner's like really very, very proud of, um, uh, proud of his work. And you can also see kind of like an interesting detail like the porch sort of pops out front and the way that the fence intersects the house, it allows the family to have a sort of a long view down the street. Um, Michael Andron's very proud that their cars have never been broken into for this reason. Um, and they're really proud of what they did. Um, this is actually an aerial photograph um, that sits on their coffee table. They had a friend who had a helicopter fly over and take some shots of it. Um, oh, here we are. Okay. Um, and here you can see it in context of other blots on the block. The second one, the blot for two sisters. Um, this is the one, um, it's about two sisters who were sort of living in the 60s, um, right before the riots. Um, and they basically incrementally bought up the land between their two homes, um, and they created this sort of shared courtyard between the two. Um, and it has the same size and density as a suburban home, um, but it's informed by the city's parcellation and the women's individual needs. So we would say like a new type emerged um, with this large shared yard between two houses. Here's a funny one, the billboard blot. This is not about someone buying a lot, it's about appropriating it. Um, this is, there's that um, house, um, Sofia Sanikiewicz's. The lot next to her is owned by Outdoor Systems. Um, Outdoor Systems keeps a billboard there because it's you know, very visible from the highway. Um, but Sofia uses the lot next door to sort of you know, tend a vegetable garden and um, park her cars. But when um, Outdoor Systems is done with their um, billboard, um, she actually takes it and uses it to cover her vegetable patch. So it creates this kind of weird symbiosis between advertising and, and gardening. Um, the courtyard blot. Um, this is one about the sort of the reorientation of the house. Jose Terrell, well, he had his house front to back. He made these expansions that opened the house to the landscape. Then he appropriated an additional lot that was still owned by the city to create a jungle gym um, and a treehouse for his kids. Here you can see a photograph of that. Now, a project like this obviously runs the risk of romanticizing bottom-up practices um, when, in fact, one could really make a good argument um, that what Detroit needs is decisive top-down planning, um, especially considering the like, really incredible inequities of the region. Um, but um, so part of this project was actually an edu educational campaign on these regional issues that we de developed in collaboration with the Center for Urban Pedagogy. So um, we obviously believe that De Detroit needs top-down planning, but we also believe that um, the practices of these self-interested homeowners are important, um, and an incremental approach to, and it offers an incremental approach to urban redevelopment, um, one that's um, that's albeit underappreciated and without legitimacy. And so we saw our role here really um, in the first place as ghostwriters, um, advocating for these practices by rendering them visible and telling stories through the kinds of diagrams um, that I've shown you. And by rendering these practices visible, um, ghostwriting is advocating for a particular practice, but also for a particular public, the public of blotters that wouldn't otherwise exist. And this is somewhat different than previous um, sort of advocacy models such as Paul Davidoff's um, in that it invites the planner architect to take a creative role in identifying a public. So the next project I'd like to tell, uh, talk about is, um, is Lens Space. Beth men mentioned this one. Um, it's a temporary sculpture part in Manhattan. Um, the, here you can see it here. Um, uh, it's a full block in Soho and it's ultimately going to be redeveloped in a couple of years. Um, but in the meantime, the Lower Manhattan um, Cultural Council, which is like a downtown arts organization, um, brokered to use this block as an exhibition space. And it's a very, very long story that I'm not going to go into right now. But we were initially um, hired to simply lay out some gravel paths um, and to make the site accessible. But we incrementally expanded um, the program and presented new ideas to make this exhibition space more public and maybe just more fun. Um, and the big opportunity of a temporary project like this is that it allows you to do things that wouldn't be possible under the um, conditions of permanence. So um, you can see uh, here, this is an aerial um, before Lent Space was built. Um, these buildings were torn down in 2002. Um, so you can see, for those of you who know this, know the site. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. So this is Canal Street. Holland Tunnel entrance is over here, and so on. Um, so um, 
there's a little plaza next to, just to the, um, to the east of it. That's Juan Darte Square. It's owned by the Parks Department. Um, and in between it is this little street um, that was actually bought by the developer, um, by the landowner. We're not exactly sure how you purchase a public street in New York City, but it did happen. Um, and this is a picture, so there it is. I um, mean, this is a picture of the, um, the site before um, we started working on it. This is, the, um, this is the edge of that park. There's that DMAP street, and there's the curb for it, and then the, the site beyond. Um, and so, uh, I'll just turn my page here. So a problem that we encountered at the very beginning of this project was that the landowner insisted that the site had to be fenced in. Um, it was basically a legal requirement um, related to the landowner's insurance, and there was absolutely no discussion about um, whether or not to have a fence. And this was a huge problem for us because um, it's like a fairly small public space for a few sculptures um, with a fence around it. It just seemed like so weird to us, like some kind of art zoo. You know, you have a fence around it, art in the middle. Um, and so after fighting the fence for a while, we actually decided to make it the most important element of the design. Um, and design a fence that would be permeable and active, a center of activity rather than a border, and it's an object that blurs the boundaries between inside and outside. So we decided to keep the existing clearly provisional construction fence on the three, so on the sort of the three sides, the north, the west, and the south, and then we built this new one um, on, the, on the east, on the, um, basically on the old building line um, of, that, of that block. And we, con we constructed this new element out of marine grade plywood. Oops, excuse me. Um, so it's like a material that's sort of clearly different from, um, from the chain link and sort of suggestive of furniture. And we made it operable. We made it possible for people to, to actually move the fence. So here you can see a diagram when the fence is closed. Um, again, the three sides um, have the chain link and then this wood wall facing the square as a sort of um, facade or as a billboard. Um, and then here's the fence on an everyday basis. Some of the fence elements are open to allow shortcuts across the site, becoming, you know, like connecting some of the workplaces and the, um, and the, um, the subway stations and so on. And then here's the, when the whole site is open, it um, kind of blurs the boundary um, between the sort of the, the, the inside of the block and the outside, the, the public space and the privately owned public space. Um, and it also creates a kind of series of compartments um, or small gallery spaces. And here you can see it in action. Um, you just open up one door to walk through. And we actually added a bench on the inside of each um, fence element, making the object like a little bit more public in that it's no longer really clearly identifiable as a fence, right? Because like, is it a fence? Is it a bench? Is this window going through it? Um, but it's something that can be used or appropriated in um, a number of different ways. So as a large sitting space, that's our client, Adam Kleiman, on the right. Um, you can also move it closer. You can have the bench face inside or outside or open up the whole thing. And so in addition um, to it being a fence, now it can create all different kinds of social spaces for people to hang out and sit and play. So here you can see some of those configurations. And here you can see it on the aerial photo. Um, there's a sculpture by the artist Tobias Putri um, that's actually made of chain link, the sort of like the layers of um, chain link that are going on the sort of the lower right corner. Um, and, and then you can also see these boxes. They're actually a movable park and a tree nursery. Um, so it was clear to us in order to create some kind of use value for the many people who worked in this area um, that this um, place needed some, um, it actually just needed some trees. Um, and but, uh, and some vegetation, but what was, seemed very strange to us is that to plant trees and that at the end of the project, you know, in three to five years, that they'd all have to be ripped out and thrown, thrown away. So, um, and we also had another problem because there was no budget for trees. Um, but so we started working with a horticulturist to see which would be the um, right way to plant trees if you wanted to be able to move them um, after a couple of years. And so it turns out that um, planting them in boxes like this works best because the roots are confined. And so we got a couple of um, trees donated um, from the Parks Department. Um, and in exchange, we, uh, the Parks Department was able to do uh, tree planting workshops as part of the so-called Million Trees campaign. Um, but in addition, we tried to um, find ways to densify the park by borrowing trees 
uh, by providing a tree nursery. So the idea is that small trees will grow here for a year or so and then, be, then move out to become street trees um, in the neighborhood. And so this idea of temporarily storing um, or borrowing the trees made a lot of sense to us given the limited lifespan of the project. Um, and we actually developed this idea um, a lot further in the, in the next project that I'm gonna show. Um, here are some images of the, um, the planting area. Um, so there's like different size planters. Uh, so little uh, spaces for art. Um, it's kind of set up like an abacus where like um, you have sort of order in one direction and disorder um, in, in the other. There's also, here's some images um, that you can find on Flickr um, of, the, of, the, of, the pro of the project suggesting that people indeed seem to use it in all sorts of unplanned ways. Um, someone um, apparently did a dance performance um, here. Um, it was also the site of a really trashy TV show um, where artists were competing uh, for a gallery show. And then uh, this past fall, this site was uh, temporarily taken over by the Occupy Wall Street protesters. Um, so I think that our dreams of appropriation happened. Um, okay, so um, now I'd like to talk about holding pattern. This was our winning proposal for MoMA's um, Young Architects Program. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, MoMA PS1 has an annual invited competition uh, to commission an architecture firm to design and build a setting for its big um, summer afternoon parties. I don't know if anybody has been to one of those called Warm Up. Um, so the program is to provide seating and shade for the thousands of visitors that come there every single weekend. Like every weekend there's approximately five to 6,000 people. Um, and this is every Saturday between, um, be, um, between June and October. Um, so when we first started thinking about um, what to do, we started wondering, you know, what happens to all this stuff after the project is over? Does it get thrown out? Um, our first thought that was that it would probably made sense to recycle. Could we design and build something that could be put to a different use once the warm-up was over? Um, the second thing we thought about a lot was this. Uh, here you can see there's the warm-up event, some warm-up events, pretty crazy. Um, PS1 is located in the borough of Queens. I don't know if any of you have been to Queens. Anyone been to Queens? Um, it's, uh, it's one of the most diverse uh, and vibrant uh, places in New York. It's probably one of the most exciting, well, you could maybe say that it's probably one of the best places on Earth. And while um, PS1 is nice and Warm Up is really a great series of events, it also seems a little insulated um, from, the, from the, all the great stuff that happens outside of um, the museum's walls. I don't know if you can see, there's like a 16-foot um, concrete fence that's sort of built along the edge of the property. Um, so we spent a lot of time in the neighborhood uh, just hanging out and trying to find out what was happening in the immediate vicinity of PS1, sort of beyond the concrete wall, so to speak, and we talked to different people. Um, one person we talked to um, runs Checker Management. Um, this is a cab company right across the street. Um, and to make the shifts, um, to the, this is a place where cab drivers sort of switch, um, make their shifts. So like there's one cab and two drivers. One drives half the day, the other one drives the other half day. And so while they're waiting to sort of make their shift, um, the owner, um, Mike, he built a small impromptu plaza, which you can see here, with plastic chairs and tables. Uh, has a shade awning in the summer and a few planters. And the drivers sit here and they share stories and they drink coffee. And we thought this was actually an interesting space and it suggested to us that PS1's programmatic requirements, seating, shade, um, they sometimes overlap with the needs of warm-ups neighbors. And it gave us this idea um, of, of, of a radical recycling um, that tries to strengthen MoMA PS1's ties um, to the neighborhood by matching warm-ups needs with the needs of the neighbors. So <clears throat> there you can see sort of it in, a in action. So we went around the neighborhood and we simply asked every institution um, or neighborhood group we met with, is there something that you need that we could design, use in the courtyard during warm-up and then donate to you in the fall once warm-up is over? So here are some examples. Yep, these are the, um, the cab drivers at Checker Management. Um, this is the guy um, across the street. Um, his name is Asi. He, um, he's um, uh, from the Teamsters. Um, they, they wanted some trees and some outdoor furniture. Uh, nearby school, they wanted a sandbox. Um, this guy from the composting center, he wanted tumblers. This guy really wanted some, um, he wanted a lifeguard uh, chair and also some trees. The dogs, they actually wanted some mulch. 
Um, and then there was this um, um, Eric, he ran a ballet school and he was looking for mirrors. Um, these guys, they um, actually um, wanted a place to wash their feet and so on and so forth. These guys wanted a rock climbing wall. And so um, we talked to a lot of organizations and frankly, um, some of them had really terrible ideas. Um, and we didn't consider those, um, but here are all of them. And we plotted out on this matrix, and we use this to sort of vet the ideas. So you can see, like on the x-axis, we have um, we have in the public interest, and in the y-axis, we have fun. And so, like, what you can see is that, like, in the lower right, um, like for example, down here, the library, um, they wanted um, they wanted books. That's in the public interest, but it's not fun. Um, over here um, is the Millstones Group. They have a couple of hundred. Um, millstones, that's neither in the public interest and not fun. So we eliminated those things and we focus really just on the upper um, right corner, things that are in the public interest and are fun. And so we built or bought, the, um, bought things for these people. Um, they requested chairs, benches, lifeguard chairs, chess tables, trees, and so on. Um, here you can see everything that we, um, that we built or we um, bought. Um, and these are the places that they're actually going to improve or they have improved. And here's a map of where everything goes. And so in some way, it's really like a neighborhood um, improvement project. Um, I can sort of show you a couple of examples of where trees are going in all these places here, um, and so on. And um, here's an illustration that we use to develop, uh, that we use to um, represent the project. Um, here you can see the museum, right? The, here's the, the museum, here's that concrete wall. Um, and uh, here we show it in the context of the neighborhood. And we think of the project as having three phases. The first is when we ask people for stuff, right? Um, so here we sort of quoted, um, quoted these requests in yellow, like uh, we need ballet mirrors for our expansion. The last phase is when um, the furniture and other stuff that was requested by these different organizations actually go out to their owners. Um, uh, and so um, this future phase is shown in these little clouds. Um, so you can see like um, up here, is um, where the sort of the, um, the the ballet the ballet mirrors are going to the um, school of ballet, Long Island City School of Ballet, and then here's what happens in the meantime during the um, during warm up over the summer. All the stuff, the trees, the furniture, the mirrors, and so on, are used in the courtyard. They're held in the courtyard. And with this approach, we radically expanded our client group um, from one client, which was um, the museum, to 50 clients. Uh, clients that included the ballet school to Five Points, which is this, like graffiti arts organization, to the Boys and Girls Club, and so on. So a holding pattern really operates like an urban design project in that um, it was really about developing an environment that responds to multiple, very different, and sometimes changing desires, something that a fixed piece of architecture could never do. Um, we sometimes liken our approach to that of the Iron Chef. Um, do people know the Iron Chef? The Iron Chef um, is given a bunch of ingredients and under tremendous time constraints and with a live audience has to make an amazing meal. Um, and like the Iron Chef here, we worked with a set of materials and objects selected by others, things that we would never have thought of on our own, like the mirrors or say for example the trees, and sought to make an interesting environment out of these ingredients. So let me show you what I mean. So for example, a lot of people wanted trees. So we located 60 red oak trees, um, trees that were donated by the New York Restoration Project in the rectangular courtyard um, that is to the right of the museum's new entrance. And we used straw bales to create planting beds and backfilled them with mulch. Um, and we planted the trees in a grid. Um, and the planters are kind of organized more like a maze, um, evoking more traditional hedge gardens. Um, and the feeling and smell in this place was really very distinct, very, very damp and organic. It smelled kind of like a forest. Um, the mirror room, which is just um, to the just right above that um, here. Um, here we had some fun referencing minimalism. Um, it worked pretty well in the context of those 16-foot concrete walls um, and the simple gravel um, ground. Um, and then um, in the main courtyard, the largest space, um, which Barry Bergdahl referred to as the public rec room. This is a funny photo, actually, that's taken at the threshold. This is not, they're not two photos. This is actually the wall dividing between the tree room and the, and the courtyard. Um, and this is where most of the items um, are placed, were placed, and where people interacted with them, like the stools, the sandboxes, the benches, picnic tables, bike stand, ping pong table, lifeguard stand. We designed the majority of the pieces as a kind of family, um, although we did buy a few things off the shelf. 
And here you can see things starting to be used. Um, and we developed a labeling system with the graphic designer's thumb. Um, there are frequent collaborators. And so each item got what we called like a museum label, because it was a museum, um, describing the piece's provenance. And it was coupled with a grid showing where all the items would go. And so just using a black marker, we circled where um, each piece, um, you know, like a long-term home was. And we also created these hold for tags that make visible that these items were just being held for someone else. Um, and we uh, actually also used a branding iron to um, burn in the holding pattern logo, which you can see at the top. So here you can see the space filling up on a warm day. We've got that Mies-inspired chaise lounge, the misting stage, the lifeguard stand, the rock climbing wall, the sandbox, the chess tables, the foosball table. Um, we also had 24 purple leaf plums in the main courtyard that we put in containers. Um, and here you can see it in full action with the furniture being appropriated and moved around in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, so here you've seen the project being used primarily by two different audiences, the museum audience and here the warm-up audience. So we also invited the organizations um, and the neighborhoods we worked with um, to make the, the people that we actually sort of um, uh, held the items for, our clients. Um, we also invited them to um, use the courtyard for programs of their, of their own choosing during the summer months. Um, so for example, Long Island City um, School of Ballet, they actually had an event um, uh, there. Um, the uh, library had a reading, the Irish Center had a quilt making workshop, uh, the, bike, um, the bike organization had a repair bike, a bike repair workshop. We also invited some of the artists, this is David Brooks, um, to do readings of their favorite books to kids. Um, the, B, uh, the aerosol arts people had a, a b-boy workshop and, and an aerosol event. Um, and so what I want to emphasize here um, is that these people, these different neighbors of uh, MoMA PS1, they had never set foot in the museum. So our goal here was in a sense to really make the courtyard more public by diversifying um, uh, this mix of people. Uh, we also worked with the museum bookstore. Um, we asked all the groups to sort of um, select a book that was important or influential. Um, and then we also made a newspaper. Um, this has like a story um, of um, each piece. It introduces the clients. And they were available in the museum and distributed out in the neighborhood. So here you can see some examples of that. Now, the courtyard gets very, very hot in the summer. Um, and to provide um, shade, um, in this part of the courtyard, we devised a canopy structure that you see here. Um, it's very simple and inexpensive. It's um, a kind of heroic s structure made out of ropes and polyjute, um, which is a very lightweight um, fabric typically used in landscaping. Um, and it has this kind of funny shape. Um, it's not something um, that we designed out of the blue, but we derived endogenously out of what's already there. Um, what we didn't want to do was to place an architectural object in here. Um, you know, some kind of beautifully designed object that would, in the end, sort of stand in the way of all the things that we wanted to encourage um, on the ground plane. Um, uh, we wanted to sort of um, define the courtyard as a space and provide shade, but not touch the ground at all uh, to create maximum flexibility. So we thought, because this is what the party is like, you need a lot of flexibility. Um, so we thought, what would happen if we just simply connected the edges of the courtyard as, um, as it already is? Um, this is a drawing that we made of the courtyard. It has a kind of funny shape. It's really the results of um, many different circumstances and design decisions over time. So for example, there's the grid in Queens. There's Jackson Avenue, which sort of slides it off at this angle. There's the old school building. And then there was this parcel that was actually owned by someone else that kind of edges, sort of nudges its way into the property. And there's that 16-foot concrete wall that someone thought in the 80s was a really good idea to build, um, which actually we grew to love, but nonetheless. Um, so we, we, the idea we came up was really quite simple. Um, there are 38 holes about two feet below the top edge of the wall. Um, we strung ropes um, from each one of these holes all the way over to the old school building across the entire courtyard to create a very lightweight and um, inexpensive support um, shade for uh, support structure for shades. And obviously, there's that neighboring parcel I mentioned. Well, we didn't want to cover that, so we had to push it in here. 
Um, and it results in this shape. It's a hyperboloid shape that's directly developed out of the architectural elements that board the courtyard. And it, in a way, it's a visualization of the odd parcel conditions. Um, here are some images of our working model during the competition phase. I think it shows the spatial richness um, of, this, of this curved surface. And we very much like this rich shape because it's made simply um, out of straight lines, and it's not derived from some kind of algorithm, um, but that it's just simply the result of connecting the edges of PS1. Here's um, a rendering we made for the competition to convince the client that it was a good idea. And here's the built thing. And here's the parametric digital model that we built in consultation with our structural engineers um, at Bureau Hoppold to find the right tension and the right placement for these ropes. Um, and even though it's a really simple move, it presented some significant structural challenges. Um, we weren't allowed to attach anything to the existing building. Um, so you can see here, this is how we attached it on the outside wall, just sort of th um, putting a sort of a threaded uh, rod through that existing hole. Um, there you can see it on the outside, and then here you can see it on the inside. Um, actually, all the, um, the fins were retractable because of a requirement that we had um, to respond to increased uh, wind loads during storms. And now look up here, you can see the top of that, the, the school building up here, sort of look up here because we're going to jump up there for in a second. There we're up at the top. Um, so uh, we held the ropes um, solely through ballast along the roof. Um, uh, basically never exceeding the snow load. So in that sense, we were really planning to take advantage of the temporary nature of the project in that we felt very confident to say that there wasn't going to be any snow um, during the installation between June to September. Okay, I'd like to quickly talk about one more project. Um, uh, it's the arsenal of exclusion and inclusion. You might wonder what that is. Um, we were invited to curate a section of the 2009 uh, uh, International Architecture Biennial in Rotterdam. It's held at the NAI. We were asked to curate the um, American section, so to speak, which was called Community. The overall theme selected by the head curator, um, Kays Christianza, was called Open City, Designing Coexistence. You might wonder, um, as we did when we got the commission, what is the open city? Kays defines it as, uh, an and I'm quoting him now, an arena in which diverse social and ethnic groups can coexist, interact, and generate complex relationships and networks that consequentially stimulate sustainable urban structures. That sounds great. And it makes you immediately think of Greenwich Village around 1961. But we thought that if we were really going to sort of deal with um, the contemporary American city in any relevant way, we'd have to look elsewhere, uh, namely in the areas where the majority of Americans live, um, in communities that um, were sort of formally referred to as the suburbs. Um, there's this astonishing number. Um, almost 80% of new housing in America was produced in planned and at least to some degree gated communities. That's pre-2008, um, pre um, the, the, these numbers I'm quoting, when housing was actually still produced. Um, and to get, uh, to get an idea, no, it's true, to get an idea about how this actually plays out out there, we decided um, in the context of this project to look at every single planned community um, that had been built over the past two years um, at that time in the US. The nice thing about this kind of package development is that it usually comes with some sort of sales brochure um, and makes the research a lot easier. Um, we ordered every single one of these brochures, um, about 500 of them, to get an idea. And we analyzed these brochures in terms of the products that were being offered, um, like the amenities, um, like 64% are gated, 49% have golf, 83% have swimming pools. But we also looked at the language that's used. Um, so 28% use the word dream, 51% lifestyle, 21% sustainability, even though only 4% are accessible by anything besides a car. Um, and for the show in Rotterdam, we then constructed a mural depicting a sample of some of the more um, interesting examples in the form of this imaginary road trip, um, introducing the mainly European audience uh, to this type of urbanization. So here's the mural. Um, we can just zoom in a little bit. Um, here's one of them, Serenbay. Has anybody been there? 
Here's a scaled site plan. And uh, here's some images of the type of housing. It's kind of a crunchy community. Um, and we also included um, uh, some paradigmatic uh, quotes. And this mural is titled, um, People Sort Themselves for All Sorts of Reasons, which is um, partly in response uh, to a lot of the literature on this type of um, development from, say, like the last 15 years, which was dominated by the assumption that this type of uh, like-minded clustering um, or sorting that appears to underlie this kind of development is based solely on fear. And we argued here that like-minded clustering, it's maybe more pervasive, but it also may be more benign than is typically assumed. So it has indeed produced racially exclusive communities of fear, but it's also produced communities for golf, fishing, and horseback riding. So for example, here's another one. Um, this is called Rainbow Vision. Um, it's for gay retirees um, in New Mexico. Um, Sky Village, this is for hobby astronomers. Um, you can see how they have this interesting new architectural typology where the hacienda meets the observatory. Um, and then hobby pilots like Jumble Air. This one's really totally amazing. You see those things that look like straight streets? Um, they're actually runways. Um, each one of these houses, like they, instead of having a garage, has a, um, a two-plane hangar. You can see some images of it here. Actually, John Travolta lives in this community. Um, so it's a little bit, it has, it's kind of you know, known. Um, and then also Snowflake. Um, this is a, a, a community for multiple, sensi uh, multiple chemical sensitivity suffer sufferers. It's really an astonishing landscape out there. Um, and so approaching this landscape in a slightly less alarmist um, and slightly more nuanced way, might, we thought it might actually help us think about the open city in less categorical terms. Um, what if we reframe the open city as something simpler? something lighter, something more everyday. What if instead of searching for, um, you know, searching in the suburbs for what Jane Jacobs um, called the so-called generators of diversity um, and constantly en ending up empty-handed, we look for inclusive experiences that people have in the course of their everyday lives, like on the suburban commute or during a trip to the supermarket. And so in the end, we might end up finding the open city, um, for example, um, in a church parking lot in Fremont, California, or at a shopping center in central Jersey that at certain times of the week there's an amazing interaction between diverse social and ethnic groups, even though this looks nothing like what we traditionally think of as a city. So the mural um, featured a number of these spaces, or rather moments, there's really, this is really kind of a time-based thing, um, in the form of these yellow bubbles um, under the title, The Open City Pops Up When and Where You Least Expect It. And now I want to show you the second part of the exhibition, um, which you'll see here on the left on this shelf. It's a dictionary of tools um, that open or close the city, with entries written by about 50 scholars, planners, and architects. With, um, and illustrated with diagrams or photos. And I want to explain why tools. This is a question I've been getting from my students. Why tools? Um, when we started thinking about the show, there were two approaches to architectural exhibitions that we wanted to avoid. On the one hand, there was this sort of um, complete focus on the architectural object, you know, kind of as a parade of masterfully designed objects with the urban featuring um, at best as context. And on the other hand, there was the type of city overview show, um, as epitomized by Ricky Burdett's 2006 biennial, um, or Biennale, where um, cities appeared as statistics and large aerial views, and where the questions that, uh, where the questions, um, that were asked were so general um, that the answers had no choice but being commonplace and really too general to being um, relevant. So instead of um, the architectural object on the one hand or the entire urbanized world on the other, we decided to focus on specific tools and technologies that have been used to construct cities. Specifically, since we were dealing with the open city, we looked at tools and technologies of exclusion or inclusion. Things ranging from, say, zoning rules to an armrest on a bench, as you can see here. You know, the thing that was designed to prevent someone from sleeping there. So in doing so, we wanted to underline the understanding, we wanted to underline the understanding of the city as something that has been constructed. 
Um, and that we as architects, planners, artists, students, we can therefore actually reconstruct and change in ways big and small. We really see the city as something malleable. And so the entries range from A, like the armrest on the bench, to B, bouncer, you know, those people who literally keep you out of a club. C, church. You might ask, how could church be used as a tool of exclusion? I want to jump back to the, to the mural. Um, look at, let's look at Ave Maria. It's a new master plan community, master plan Catholic community near Naples, Florida. It was funded by the notoriously conservative founder of Domino's Pizza. Anybody been there? Um, it includes 800 residential units um, and this church. Um, it was the explicit goal of, of, of um, Moynihan to create a community of Catholics. So the residents of Ave Maria pay a monthly fee for the maintenance of the church. And obviously, it wouldn't be legal to exclude non-Catholics from buying a home in Ave Maria, or even to market this as specifically um, Catholic clientele. But who would be willing to pay a steep fee for a church they didn't use? So in this way, the church building, through its high maintenance costs, is a subtle tool of exclusion. Or as the author of this um, entry, the legal sco scholar Lior Stra Strahilovitz, I always mispronounce his name, Strahilovitz, um, it, he calls it um, an exclusionary amenity. So it provides the answer to the question, how do you create an exclusive community of Catholics without doing anything illegal when the Fair Housing Act prohibits exclusion based on religion? So um, there are different ways of navigating this arsenal. Um, different guided tours, so to speak. So you can read it as a history of American urbanization by reading one set of entries, um, or you can read it as a catalog of exemplary projects by reading another set, or you can read it as a call to action, and so on. So we proposed um, five tours. Tour one is so you want to understand why, why America is so racially segregated. This one's um, kind of a depressing urban history lesson um, to remind readers that segregation was the product of dozens of local, state, and federal policies. Um, and though these overt tools are no longer in use, the legacy of each is nonetheless still present. Tour two, so you want to understand why segregation persists 40 years after the Fair Housing Act. Um, these are the sort of the newer, um, subtler weapons that continue to produce racially homogeneous communities. Um, this tour contains entries on conditions, covenants, and restrictions, homeowner associations, and the exclusionary amenity, um, as I mentioned before. Uh, incidentally, the same kind of tool is used in like Muslim uh, suburban communities like this one, Peace Village, um, just outside of Toronto. You have to pay to sort of um, use the, uh, you have to, there's a maintenance fee for the mosque. Now, also, um, just to sort of add something to the, um, the exclusionary amenity, like uh, golf courses are also an exclusionary amenity. Why? Because when many, like at one point, almost uh, all gated communities had, an ex um, had a golf course, and that was because statistically, I think something like 99% of golfers were white, so it was actually used as a way to actually segregate the, um, the incoming residents. So, um, okay, so tour three. So you want to understand the weak tactics of the strong. These are like no cruising zones, residential parking per permits, the armrest on benches, um, classical music. Some shopping centers, they use these little speakers to blast classical mu music to keep s skateboarders away. Um, the, the residential parking permit, um, that's a way that actually it prevents anybody from the outside to parking and thereby coming in and visiting a community. Um, these are, this tour highlights what we call the weak tactics of the strong, subtle, pathetic attempts to close the city to so-called undesirables without too much fanfare. So this was all pretty depressing so far, but what about the open city? So there's tour four, so you want to see who's working undercover for the open city. Uh, these are, these um, weapons are uh, a collection of everyday phenomena. That, um, that are sort of opening the city unintentionally. They're not conceived of um, by architects or planners or policy ma makers, but nonetheless, these weapons um, are, well, we think they're weapons that actually architects, planners, and policy makers would be wise to co-opt. Um, what would be an example of this? Um, for example, the designated smoking area. 
anybody's seen those, it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, smoking has become prohibited in more and more places. There are fewer and fewer places um, where um, smokers um, can actually smoke. So they have to cluster sharing cigarettes with people that they may have very little in common. So like in most offices, for example, you have a CEO, a middle manager, the IT staff, and um, a cleaning person sharing the same space to enjoy a cigarette. Um, Halloween, um, where neighborhood boundaries and boundaries between public and private evaporate for a day. Famous people houses, famous people's houses is a funny one. Um, if you're famous enough, your house will become a national landmark and access to your house will have to be provided even if you live in a gated community. This is the case of Thomas Edison's house, which is in one of the most exclusive communities in New Jersey, Llewellyn Park. So if you say, I wanna go see Thomas Edison's house, they have to lift the gates and invite you in. Um, and so, there it is, the image of the gates, it's pretty cool. And then, um, tour five, so you wanna fight fire with fire. This tour is aimed at planners, policymakers, and community activists bent on opening the city with ambitious, immodest, game-changing policy tools, uh, forced busing, inclusionary zoning, community land trusts, uh, displacement free zones. These strong tactics of the weak look to undermine market idealizations and reverse some of the longstanding damage done by the weapons in tour one and two. So here you can see some of those. Now you'll see that some of these um, entries, like map, they have a star. Um, these are uh, proactive projects by architects and planners that we picked or commissioned for the show, projects that try to contribute to what we call an everyday open city. Um, here's a project by um, the uh, LA um, Urban Rangers, it's called MAP. And they basically have a map that shows access to Malibu's public beaches by pointing out public access ways um, and public easements that have been obscured by misleading signage and private development. And since we did this exhibition, um, the project has really expanded a lot. Um, we find tools everywhere, um, and we're about to finish a book on this. Um, and for this book, we, um, we created this illustration. It was inspired by um, Peter Bruegel's 100 uh, Dutch Proverbs, and in it, it assembles all 101 weapons of the arsenal in one imaginary landscape. So that's it. Thank you.